This is the Dreamers Podcast, episode 12, with brand strategist, Latoya Bond. Today is April 12th. And then I came in as a receptionist. And when I got there, I noticed that they didn't have urban brands. And urban streetwear was huge at that time. I just proposed it to them. I said, can I go and pitch and solicit and see if we can bring in some urban clients? And if I, mm-hmm. if I bring them in, can I become an account manager? And they say, yeah, I always had an entrepreneurship spirit. Even the fact that I worked for a corporation, I wasn't the type of person that just went in and did a nine to five. I always was looking for an innovative way to get ahead. And so it wasn't hard for me to basically do the same thing, but do it for myself. This episode is brought to you by Dream of Legacy. Check out dreamoflegacy.com for resources to assist you on your journey to financial independence. Hello world, welcome to the Dreamers Podcast. I am Stephanie Annies, also known as Annies Wealth. I am a financial coach and an author. I self-published my first book, Dream of Legacy, a guide to help dreamers reach financial independence and build generational wealth. In this podcast, I'll have conversations with experts and thought leaders who dare to follow their dreams. You'll hear about their journey and their money stories. I hope it inspires you, dreamers out there, to live life on your own terms. Come on, dreamers. Let's change the world. Hello, dreamers. Welcome back to the Dreamers Podcast. I am your host, Annelise Wealth. And today on the podcast, I am talking to brand strategist Latoya Bond. Latoya is the founder and CEO of the BBM agency. In uh, 2007, she walked away from her corporate career after finding out that her son was born deaf. Latoya made the decision to become a stay-at-home mom to provide her son with the care that he needed. A few years later, she decided to give entrepreneurship a try and started an accessory company with her best friend. That was the beginning of her entrepreneurial journey. She then leveraged her expertise to become a consultant and then a brand strategist. Today, with her agency, she's a brand strategist for many personal brands as well as business brands. Before we get into this episode, please go to Apple Podcasts right now and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. That will help more dreamers discover the podcast. All right, here's Latoya Bond. Latoya Bond, welcome to the Dreamers Podcast. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about you and uh, what you do as a brand strategist? I am Latoya Bond, as mentioned. I'm a mom to three kids. I have a 14-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 4-year-old. I own the agency called the BBM Agency. BBM stands for Building Brown Millionaires. And I'm a brand strategist. My goal as a a brand strategist is to help women of color, female founders launch and grow their businesses. I've been doing it now for about 11 years. Immediately prior to me being an entrepreneur, I was working for a fashion manufacturing company as a project manager. So what led you to leave corporate America? My job was great. I loved it. And, you know, it was in a creative space. So it was very flexible. I traveled a lot. I traveled to Europe for fashion week. I traveled to China a lot for productions. That's where our factory was. So it was great. Um, In 2006, I got married and had my first child. And my son was born deaf. And that changed my life in a big way because he needed a lot more attention than a regular newborn. So we had to make the decision as a family, which one of us would be able to kind of stay home and just manage that whole situation. Like it required a lot of intervention, a lot of different types of therapy and things of that sort. So, you know, we made the decision that I would stay home. For about two years, I was a stay-at-home mom, trying to make sure that my son had the the best resources and the best life and medical care available to him. We ended up doing a surgery with him called cochlear implant surgery, which is a device that's planted inside of the cochlea in the ear. And if you have a certain kind of hair loss, which my son did and was qualified for, with this surgery, they they could actually fix hearing loss. 
loss. Mm. So once he got that, that surgery at two years old, he was then able to hear, but he was a year behind development because he couldn't hear for the first hit, the first year of his life. So then we had to go through lots of speech therapy and um, different types of therapies so that he can learn how to hear, you know, identify the sounds that he were hearing and ultimately speak. It took a lot of work and dedication as a family, a lot of patience. But, you know, today he's 14. He is he hears and speaks um, just as good as the average person. You know, if you first meet him, but he doesn't use sign language. He's in a mainstream school in a regular classroom. You can have a conversation with him. So that time that we took to invest in his development was time well spent. Well, I'm glad he was able to get the surgery. Was that your first child? That yep, that is that is my first child, and yes, he was able to get the surgery, which was a blessing because our lives would be completely different. Like you know, we would be using sign languages to communicate, and it would be a different life. So, how many kids do you have now? I have three kids. So, how do you go from being a stay-at-home mother to now starting your company? About two years into staying at home. When things kind of smoothed it out and it got to be more manageable. In that time, we moved from New York City. That's where I worked um, in the fashion business. We moved to Georgia, to Atlanta, where my mom was. And I started to try to re-enter the work- workforce and, you know, look for jobs that was in production that was here in Atlanta. And it really were only two companies that would allow me to do the same thing, which was Carter's and um, and Oshkosh, which now have merged into one company. So finding something in that field would have been difficult. And one of my best friend at the time, she's always been a hustler. So she's never really worked a traditional nine to five. We put our heads together and we decided to launch an accessories business. And I took my skills with sourcing in China and production and just organizational skills. We put our heads together. We were doing pretty well with it. We were selling online. We also were doing lots of pop-up shops and trade shows like up and down the East Coast. And so that was going really well. So that was my introduction into entrepreneurship. Do you still have that business today? No. So the business actually merged into something else. So about, I would say, maybe two years into us doing that, Yandy Smith, who was a college friend of mine, we went to Howard together. She, at the time, was a producer of Love & Hip Hop. She's actually the one, the person that created Love & Hip Hop. She was working behind the scenes as a producer, but at some point they decided that they wanted her to come from behind the camera and actually be a cast member. And so she called me one day and she said, I'm going to be a cast member on Love & Hip Hop. I really don't want to do it. But if I do it, I want to make sure that I'm doing it and that there's a message and a meaning behind it. I want to use this opportunity to make sure that I'm launching a business. And she wanted to do an accessory line also. And so I just said, I was like, well, you know, I have an accessory. We have an accessories business already. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, like a conflict of interest for me to help you basically create the same business that I'm also Mm -hmm. doing. So why don't we just merge and join forces and we can have the business together? That's a win-win situation. It gives us a larger platform. And then you have, you know, a built-in business, a business uh, model to go with. Merge business. Our business was called Accessorize with Style. And then when we merged with Yandy, we came up with a new name and the name was Everything Girls Love. So that's how Everything Girls Love began. And um, it, and then it just emerged from there. So Everything Girls Love um, was your, I guess, your second business. And then from there. Yes. How did you, uh, I'm sure the listeners are wondering, how did you get into <laughs> brand strategy? So Everything Girls Love started off as an accessories business. It's EGL. Um, That business is still in business now and has expanded from being accessories to being a lifestyle brand, to having EGL productions, and also to have EGL PUD, which is a nonprofit agency. And um, I was the CEO of that. Well, not was. I am the CEO of that company and of all of the affiliate arms of of that company. So in building EGL, And building that into a brand and also paying attention to Yandy's brand. So when we started, when we did EGL as an accessories line and just the fact that Yandy was a a manager in the entertainment industry for so long. When we were on the show, when she was on the show and, you know, we would start to get customer service emails. a, A lot of them would be about the products, but a lot of them would just be questions about 
you know, I want to ask Yandy, you know, how did she start a business? I want to give her career. I want to ask her career advice and things of that sort. And then they would start to ask questions about, you know, us as a team. Like, you know, how did you guys start the business? How do you guys balance being business women? And so we were just like, there's something to this because a lot of women, it was that, that was like, I think right at the boom where women were starting to really, um, you know, come into themselves and, and not being afraid of being the breadwinners and, you know, consider entrepreneurship. And so we said, this needs to be more than just us selling a product. You know, we need to really create a lifestyle because we all have a lot of things to share just in terms of womanhood. And so we expanded, um, the EGL accessories to be an actual lifestyle brand. And we, we launched the everything girls love blog, which was a destination, like a lifestyle for, for women to go to. And we covered different aspects of life. So we had health and wellness. We had a relationship section. We had a home section. We had fashion, we had beauty, we had a business section. And it, it became a go-to place for, for like, you know, women entrepreneurs or just, or just women that had ambition in general. And um, from there, we we started to do live events because then we had the blog and was like, OK, we have this whole blog community and it's going great. But how do we actually give women a place to actually connect and to like collaborate and for them to grow together? And not only for us to be the people sharing information, but there's things that we can learn from some of these women. So we then we started doing the um, the girls love events, which was basically bringing the blog to life. So there were three day weekends. And in those weekends, we had different breakout workshops that covered all the different sections. So we would have one on beauty and one on wellness and one on fashion and one on entrepreneurship and business and those things. And so it grew into that. And then all along the way, I became Yandy's brand strategist you know, just out of need, you know, as the face of our brand, it was important for us to to pay attention to what she was doing on Love and Hip Hop, to be strategic about the, the things that she decided to get involved in and to position her to be a leader. I became her brand strategist. And throughout the years of me working, not only, you know, on our brand, Everything Girls Love and growing that in so many ways, and then working with Yandy as her brand manager, different people started to come to me when they would ask Yandy, well, like, you know, who, who you're working with? Who's your brand strategist? Who's your manager? And she would introduce them to me. And then people started to ask me to work with them. They wanted to know, like, how is it that you're on this show, but you managed to keep your brand clean and you manage to still position yourself and be respectful and actually have women look up to you. Mm -hmm. And so they would ask her who's responsible for that. And then she would lead them to me. And then that's kind of how my roster of clients started to grow. It just grew by word of mouth. I'm the type of person that you're not going to find too many things that I'm going to say, I don't know how to do because I can always figure it out. I'd rather say, yes, I can do it. And then go home and be like, okay, I need to take this course. I need to hire somebody and figure out how to execute on it. So that's just kind of how I approach life in general. And so I would take on different clients, take on different cha challenges and helping people build their personal brands, but then also helping them build businesses. Like having a brand called Everything Girls Love that was providing information and resources on everything girls love, you know, specifically for women of color, I became an expert on women of color and how they were as consumers and what things they responded to and how to market to them. And so when I had clients that came to me that wanted to launch a product or they had a personal brand, they wanted to provide a service and their target market was women of color, it was perfect because I know how to cultivate that demographic. It just was an easy marriage. One client turned into two, two turned into four. I said, okay, well, I need to make this official. Let me make it an agency. Let me actually put some services together, put it out there. And so that's how the actual BBM agency was formed. It seems that you kind of became an entrepreneur out of necessity. And then you're just spending by adapting to your environment and offering more and more services. Yes, I agree. I would say that. And then I would also say that I didn't realize it at the time, but even when I was working in the fashion industry, I started as the receptionist. There was only two Black people there. And then I came in as a receptionist. And when I got there, I noticed that they didn't have urban brands. And urban streetwear was huge at that time. Like the Sean Johns and the Fat Farms and even Ralph Lauren was modeling his um, merchandise towards the urban market. 
I just proposed it to them. I said, can I go and pitch and solicit and see if we can bring in some urban clients? And if I, mm-hmm. if I bring them in, can I become an account manager? And they said, yeah, if you can go and you can get a meeting, then we'll go with you and we'll pitch it and we'll see if we can bring them in. And I did that. I took that job as a receptionist because I wanted to break into fashion industries, which is why I took a, a job as a receptionist. But prior to that, I had worked at BET as a producer. I had worked at Vibe Magazine in the marketing department. I had worked at a PR firm. So I had a lot of, of, of um, experience in the entertainment space. And I also had a lot of contact. I went to Howard University. Our alumni base is really strong and we do a lot to support each other. So I knew that I could get my foot in the door and be able to get meetings, you know? So when I was able to get the meetings with Rockaway, Fat Farm, and I got meetings with Sean John, which were three of the top urban markets. Then the team came together. The owner of the company, his name is Stephen Beglider. He came in and gave me all the resources that I need to put together a really good presentation. He actually came to the presentation with me and we pitched it and we got the accounts. And so once we got the accounts, that's how I became an account manager. And I say that to say that I always had an entrepreneurship spirit. Even the fact that I worked for a corporation, I wasn't the type of person that just went in and did a nine to five. I always was looking for an innovative way to get ahead or to move up. And so it wasn't hard for me to basically do the same thing, but do it for myself. And so it seems that even with your, I guess, your corporate job, you actually took a step back by taking that job as a receptionist because it kind of fit into your long-term goal of getting into the fashion industry. Sometimes, you know, People might feel, I'm already up here. I'm not going to go back. Taking a step back can actually get you, uh, help you get to your destination. Absolutely. And I think that can be can be a detriment because a lot of times when you graduate out of college, you start and you, you're trying to figure out what you really want to do in life. Most of the people that I know don't work in the fields that they that they got degrees in. They work in completely different fields. But typically when you graduate, you try to get an entry level job in whatever that field is. And once you actually work in that industry, you might realize that this doesn't make me happy. Like this isn't my passion. It doesn't fulfill me. And I've always been the type of person that I want to be happy. Like I want to go to work every day and love going to work. I want to be happy. I don't want to be miserable. I don't want to go to a job that I hate going to. And I was young. I was in my 20s. There's going to be any time where you can take a step back and start over and take a lower pay is going to be that time. Like when you're, when you start to have kids and you have responsibilities and you got college tuition and all of those things to think of, it's harder to do it at that time. So if I would definitely say, if you're in your twenties now, early thirties, and you don't have a lot of responsibility in terms of like a husband and a family, and you know that the industry that you're working in isn't fulfilling you, you should absolutely make a switch. You know, sometimes you got to leave money on the table. And I, mm. I say that now, even in business as an entrepreneur, you can't take every single job. You got to be able, you got to be willing to leave some money on the table or go back and start over so that you ultimately can get to the destination you're trying to get to. If you've been around for a while, then you know how much I care about financial freedom for all. One thing that often gets in the way of that is debt. That's why I'm happy to announce that I've partnered with an amazing organization called Juno. Juno helps you get lower interest rates by using the power of group negotiation. It is a completely free resource that you can use to secure lower interest rates on new and existing student loans. Head to the link in the episode show notes to find out more. Sunday, skincare day is one of the ways I keep my sanity in these crazy times. Jumino is an all-natural, black-owned skincare brand, carefully handcrafted by parents who could not find the proper care solutions to address their family skin problems. All Jumino products are made of organic and high quality ingredients, meticulously chosen to give your skin the smooth results and the glow it deserves. Can you talk to 
to us about some of the brands that you manage today. So I work with individuals and I also work with business owners. So some of the individuals that I work with is Yandy Smith. I work with her on her personal brand. So that means the, the branding and positioning of Yandy Smith as an entity, separate from any businesses that she owns. Okay. I also work with Tamika Mallory. I work with my son, Linian. I work with Jamila Davis. Pretty much Linda Sasso, the whole Until Freedom team. Those are my clients that I do personal branding with. Um, I also represent brands that some of you might know. Of course, Yandy's brand, Yell Skincare. Pretty much any business that Yandy has, I have helped her create and build. Like as her brand strategist, when she says, I want to do A, B, C, and D, it's my job to kind of make those things come to fruition and be involved in it. Like for example, Tamika right now wants to to um, have a Tamika Mallory action figure. So I'm mm. in the process of trying to make that come to fruition. So Yell Skincare is one of the brands that I represent. Um, Coil Hair Care, which is now expanding to be just a beauty line because she's really since skincare and as well as cosmetics under that. Black Women's Lives Matter, which is a apparel brand, but it's also positioned to be a media outlet. So mm-hmm. it's it's a brand of apparel. We're building a big following and being able to capture news. Like that was the angle of it. Let's build up a, a platform, but that's focused on giving news about things that's happening around and to Black women. So those are the few, a few of the companies that, that I work with. So can you tell our listeners what investing in a brand strategist or a branding agency can do for your business or for your personal brand? To me, it can be the difference between your brand being successful and not being successful, right? And then successful, it means that you are constantly growing. You're growing in revenue, you're growing in your community, and and you're scaling consistently. You know, it doesn't have to be at a fast pace, but it has to be consistently. And I don't necessarily think that you have to invest in the brand strategies. You have to invest in branding, period. So branding means the aesthetics of your brand. And it, it consists of three things, the aesthetics, like what your brand looks like. That means your logo, your website, the colors, the aesthetics of it all, what people see. Then it's the brand story. And the brand story is what makes you different from everybody else on the market that may be selling a similar product? What is your brand story? What's the thing that your consumer can connect to that makes them want to support this brand and makes them want to invest in this brand? The last thing is your is your, your brand positioning, right? Which is your niche. I think once you have those three things, you have a solid foundation for building your brand. And you don't necessarily need to invest in a brand strategist to get that. You can just invest in research. You can do your research. Cause I didn't invest in a brand strategist when I started, I did the research. I studied the demographic, like the, it's important to know your audience. When you're launching a business, you need to focus on the audience that you have or the audience that you know, you, you have access to and not on a product. Like some people have an idea and they'd be like, okay, I'm going to create snow boots, but I live in California, you know, or I live in on an island. It's like, why are you, who are you going to sell those <laughs> snow boots to? So I think that you should do it the other way, which is think about the demographic that you have, the target market. If you launched a product today, who would consume it? Like, do you have an audience already built in, whether it's your church family, your actual family, your community, a club that you're involved in? Do you have an audience that can consume that product right away? And if you do it that way and you think about all of those things and you do your research to make sure that you have the foundation solid, then you can still have the same um, benefits that you will have from a brand strategist. Now, some people just don't have the wherewithal to do that stuff. They may be very finance minded. So they Mm -hmm. might be all about accounting and math and that part of the business. They're not really into the creative part of it. And so they need to hire someone like me. And then there's other people who whose product took off. So like Waste Snatchers, that's another client that I have that's very successful. And this was years ago. She launched a product. An influencer ended up getting their hands on it and posting it and her brand took off. And she hadn't really invested any time into branding, into what the brand looked like, what her brand story was, what her target market was. She didn't invest any time into that. So once once the, the sensation of like, the post from the influencer, you know, kind of plateaued and then it wasn't any more growth. 
that's the point where you have to figure out, okay, how am I going to get my business to the next level now? Mm-hmm. You know? And so some people come to me at that point. It's like, I've been in business for three years. I've done really well, but I'm not growing. And so I need to rebrand. And it's, we call it a rebrand because they're already in business, but it's actually branding to begin with because they never did that. Once you're making money, you're like, I'm making money. Who cares about all this other stuff? At a certain point, if you don't have a strong brand, those things are going to plateau. I have people that come to me at that point as well. Thank you for sharing those tips. So for any of the dreamers listening right now who might be interested in doing what you do, what advice do you have for them to get started and to land their first client? I think that you need to have a successful example. I personally don't think people can sell people how to do something they've never done before. And to me, that's a red flag. Like if you're if you're going to say that you're a brand strategist and that you can help somebody build a six figure brand, but you don't have testimonies from six figure brands that you've actually built or you yourself don't have a six figure brand to use as an example, then I don't believe you. You know, and other people shouldn't believe you either. Like, you know, I don't want to be your test dummy. The number one thing is to is to make sure that you're well versed in the business that you're going into and make sure that you have receipts. There's a lot of people on social media in this world that say I can do this. I can do that. And they they're great at marketing. They're great at creating great content and making a good social media page. But where are the receipts? Like, do they have do they have testimonies from actual businesses that they can point to, to that that can you can use as a reference and say, OK, I saw where this business started and I seen where they're going or, or do they themselves have a business? If they don't have that, then um, I, I don't think it's a good model. So for someone that so, wants to go into this business, I would say that you need to start there. Like you need to create your own brand. And if your brand is going to be as a, as a brand strategist, then all the tips and the tricks that you will be advising your customers or everything that you would be putting into a proposal or a, or a strategic plan for one of your clients, you need to put those things into yourself or you need to make your own business go. Then you can be able to say that I can do this for somebody else. So uh, how has the pandemic affected your business? Did you have to pivot in any way? No, the pandemic, thank God, has not affected my business at all. I think you have two ends of the spectrum with the pandemic. I think that the pandemic has affected a lot of nine to fivers hard because corporations closed down or they downsized. But for me and pretty much everybody that's on my roster, like business has been booming. You know, the business has been doing extremely well. I don't have any clients that I work with that have not done well during the pandemic. And I think that is is in part because, you know, people were at home and people just realized that I need to be an entrepreneur too. You know, I need to figure out how I can have a stream of income that's not necessarily dependent on a job, you know, and, and and I need to have multiple streams of income so that if one is moving slow, I can depend on the other, the other ones to keep me going. So yeah, by the grace of God, business has been great. It hasn't really affected me, even personally. Like my kids were out of school for for the first half of 2020. So the schools closed in March, but our schools here, we go to summer break in May and then we went back to school in August. My kids go to a small private school. So they open back up in August and they've been to school since. We haven't had any um, COVID scares. It's a blessing. It's great to hear. Uh Is there anything you wish you had known before starting your first business? I would say that in general, and even now, I wish that our community, which is where you come into, is just more aware and mindful about managing money and saving money and what's important, retirement and all of those things, investments and all of those things, because I am not, math, finances is not my strong point. You know, if it, when it comes to like a budget for a business, yes. But when it comes to just like lifestyle, no. And and when you're an entrepreneur, you don't have 401ks. Like I was talking to one of my girlfriends that she works in corporate America. She called me the other morning. She was like, girl, I think I'm a millionaire. And I was like, what? I was like, what happened? And she was like, I was just looking at my portfolio and I have like 600 thousand dollars in stocks, you know, from this. And I have four hundred thousand dollars for my 401k from you know X, Y, and Z. And you know, because with, with Bank of America and a lot of corporate jobs, they get um shares and all of those things. And so like that's great. 
And as an entrepreneur, I just started thinking about those things. You know, like I just started maybe in the last couple of years. I'm so glad you're bringing up that point because when you're an entrepreneur, a lot of times you're, like you said, you're not thinking about retirement. At because all. You, there's nothing that's set up for you. So you have to go and open that solo uh, yes. 401k or that set by RA. You have to do that or you even have to know that, it's, that it exists. You don't think that it exists because you think exactly. that it's only for corporations. I didn't have those things. And it's so okay. interesting, right? Because like the government actually will favor entrepreneurship because a solo entrepreneur 401k, you can put 57,000 every year. When you work for a corporation, you can only put... 19.5. So it's just like even getting the message out there so that people know that it exists is, uh, is so important. It's important. And it's, and I'm still learning. Like I just started to think about investment and investing in stocks. And like I said, that part of it, I think is important. I think when you're an entrepreneur and you are basically managing your finances, you can make $500,000. And by the time you finish your taxes, you only made a hundred thousand because you've expensed or written off so many things. And I learned that that comes back to bite you in the butt. Like when Mm -hmm. it's time to buy a house and you're like, Oh, I can afford this $450,000, $500,000 house. And they're like, okay, well, where's your taxes? And they was like, well, you can't afford it on paper. And you're like, but I made this much, but you expend, you made that much, but you, you on your taxes, you didn't claim that much, you know? So all of those things, I think it's important. So I would say that just being more savvy with how to manage personal finances and business finances, like even with a W-2, like I just put myself on W-2 in 2020 and paying myself a W-2 salary. Like I did, I gave myself a salary as like a 1099, but doing it as a W-2 is completely different. You're taking out your workers' comp and your taxes and your unemployment. And it's easier for you to show a W-2 when it's time to like buy homes and do things. They know that that money is coming out every month automatically. So I think all of those things, I wish that if I would have started that, like, 11 years ago when I started this journey, I would be in a much better place in terms of like savings and investments and that sort of thing. Thank you for sharing that. I'd like to end the interview with a round of rapid fire questions. Sure. Tell me about a book that changed your perspective on life. One of the books that was written by a friend of mine, her name is Precious Avoclia and the book is called Just Breathe. And it was a book about like mindful moments and manifestation and Mm. just meditation, really. And so I think like I have always considered myself to be spiritual, but I never really took the time to kind of just sit and be still and to like meditate with intention. And that book did a lot for me in 2020. It just helped me to become more self-aware about the importance of self-care and making sure that I took time for myself and that I just took time to like be still with my thoughts and to get myself together. You know, a lot of times as entrepreneurs, you you work all the time. You don't have a start time or end time and you're always accessible and your plate is always full. And I think as I'm becoming more solid, like, you know, as a businesswoman and my foundation and my finances and all of those things that I now have the flexibility to say no more and to, you know, make sure that I do have an end date to my day, you know, and that I carve out time for myself. I carve out time for my family. And so that's, that would be one of the books that I recommend. That sounds like a great one, especially like right now where, you know, a lot of people, are still doing virtual learning and managing work and the kids being at home, remembering to take some time and for self-care. Yes. And just to disconnect and just breathe. The book is called Just Breathe and like literally just breathe. One thing about money you wish you could tell your younger self. If you don't have it, don't spend it. Don't use credit. I think you need to be wise and know how to use credit and make credit work for you. You also should be able to pay off your credit. If you use a credit card, you should be able to pay that credit card at the end of the month. That means you don't have it if you have to finance it and you should not do that. That's a great one. One of the best investments that you made in yourself or that you've made so far? One of the best investments I would say that I've made so far is in my kids' education. My kids go to private school, like I said, is probably about $30,000 a year. And for a lot of people, they'd be like, oh my God, you pay so much for school. But you guys spend that on partying if you add it up (laughs) or you spend it on going out to restaurants. That's one of the best investments that I've made is actually invested for my kids to have a quality education. Nice. 
Fill in the blanks in three words or less. Money to me is... Money to me is freedom. What do you want your legacy to be? That I've left a business that my kids could inherit and continue to grow and work at so that they can start their lives off as entrepreneurs and not have to work for anyone. Well, Latoya, thank you so much for coming on the Dreamers podcast and sharing your story. So uh, please tell our dreamers where they can find you if they want to learn more about you and your business. You can find me at on all social media platforms at Bonded Forever. So B-O-N-D-E-D, the number four ever, Bonded Forever. And then, or my company, which is the bbmagency.com. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a great interview. All right. That was Latoya Bond. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Dreamers Podcast. You can find today's show notes and all of the links mentioned during the episode at dreamoflegacy.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, here's what you can do to support me and help more dreamers discover the podcast. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. I read every single review and I'll select one review to read on the podcast every month. Subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Share the podcast with your family, friends, and coworkers. And if you really enjoyed today's episode, tag me on Instagram at the dreamers that podcast and let me know what you liked about it. All right, dreamers, that's it for today. I will see you back here next week for another episode of the dreamers podcast. Okay, dreamers, time to build this legacy. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It is not intended to provide any tax, legal, financial planning, insurance, accounting, investment, or any other kind of professional advice or services. Please consult with an appropriate tax, financial, or legal professional to receive appropriate advice based on your situation.